Sometimes you come to the meditation really eager to meditate, and other times you just drag yourself here. But it's important that we do the meditation every day, every day. As the Johns often say, when you're in the mood to meditate, you meditate. When you're not in the mood to meditate, you meditate. Because you realize it's a necessary thing to do. It's really amazing in our culture where so many things are required, but meditation is regarded as optional for people who have the time or the inclination. But it's really something we need for our well-being. If we don't train the mind, the mind can just turn around and destroy itself. That's what the teaching on suffering is all about. If suffering were just something that happened to us because of things outside, if conditions outside were bad, we suffered, and if conditions were good, we don't suffer then the issue wouldn't be inside, or the issue would be outside. The thing is, when conditions are bad, we can suffer, and when conditions are good, we can still suffer. And when we see that, we get sometimes pulled down into a, a whirlpool. It just goes deeper and deeper. So you have to pull yourself out. Fortunately, you don't have to pull anything. You're just going to let the whirlpool go, just right here with the breath. You're not asked too much. Just be here with the breath. It's your lifeline. And what you do with the breath is totally up to you right now. It's amazing how the mind can take a really simple instruction like this and create a lot of suffering around it, too. Remember when I was with a John Fu very early on, he told me one time, your only duty all day long is just to watch your breath. It sounded oppressive. I had, I had a duty that I had to do all day long. He was trying to tell me that was, there was nothing else that required of me, at least at that point. And so this message which was meant to give me a sense of lightness, a sense of freedom. I was able to make it into a message of oppression. It's the same way with the working with the breath. Sometimes you don't have the energy to work with the breath, or things don't seem to be going well. Just be with the breath. Do what you want with the breath. Learn to talk to yourself as you meditate in any way that gives you a sense of, of freedom. You can play with the breath if you want, and you don't have to play with it if you don't want. Or if you find the mind isn't willing to stay with the breath, find some topic that you do find inspiring. Think about the goodness of your generosity, the goodness of your virtue. You think about the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. One of the really fine things about Buddhism, it was founded by someone who knows what it was like to make a mistake. Even in his last lifetime, the Buddha made a huge mistake, six years of tormenting himself. In all those previous lifetimes, you look in the Jataka stories, it's not like the, the Buddha was always perfect. He was making mistakes and having to learn from them. So unlike a religion that's supposedly founded by a god who's never been a human being, the Buddha knows what it's like to make a mistake and to have to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and move on. Those instructions he gives to Rahula are really useful. He said, if you see that you've made a mistake, admit the mistake. Talk it over with someone else, and then simply resolve not to repeat that mistake. You don't have to carry the guilt around with you. 
just the memory that, okay, that was a mistake, and you move on. The Buddha gave the same instructions to a, a village headman. You see, you made a mistake. You realize that remorse is not going to go back and undo the mistake, so sitting around in remorse is not going to help. You recognize, okay, that was a mistake, and you decide you're not going to do that, and then have lots of goodwill. Goodwill for yourself, goodwill for everybody. The goodwill for yourself is to remind yourself not to torment yourself needlessly, and the goodwill for everybody is to firm up that resolve that you're not going to do anything to harm other people. So try to keep these attitudes in mind, because as we meditate, we're going to be learning from our mistakes. We're going to see our mistakes. After all, what is craving and clinging but a mistake? Ignorance is a mistake. We're all coming from mistakes. We've begun to realize that and recognize the mistakes as such. That does, that's where there's hope for us. It's when people refuse to recognize their mistakes. There's no hope at all. And John Fuang had a student one time who would never admit, ever, 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 to having made a mistake. His comment for her, what this person was, was someone whose farts don't smell. And there is no such person in the world, but people like to pretend. So when you look at meditation and things aren't going well, remind yourself, at least you're better than someone who doesn't recognize that the problem is with the mind. And you realize there's work to be done, and you've got some sense of how to do it. That's a beginning right there. And you may not like to be right back at the beginning, but oftentimes that's what happens. As you meditate, you find yourself making progress, and then all of a sudden, zoom, you're back. There's a little doll they have in Japan, and when you throw it on the ground, it'll tip over, and then it will right itself. And they use it as training for children. See, the doll falls over, and it picks itself back up. When you see you've made a mistake, be like the doll. Regain your balance. Stop and take stock of things. Try to see where your thinking has been harmful to yourself, where you've been deluding yourself, getting involved in ways of thinking that are really off balance. And recognize them, because that kind of thinking is that kind of thinking. But your awareness is something else. The Buddha has that passage about the mind being luminous, and it's darkened by visiting defilements. He said, this is the knowledge that allows us to train the mind. Now, he's not saying that the mind is naturally good. He's just saying that it's bright. Which means that when the defilements come, they're like clouds blocking the sun. As the clouds move away from the sun, the sun hasn't been stained by the clouds. That awareness is still there. Good, bad, and different. the awareness is there. You try to focus in on that, just to be aware of what's going on, seeing what's going on, so you can understand it. If you don't understand it, watch it. Have some patience. Whatever comes up, just watch, watch, watch. Until you see something that interests you, and then focus in on that. In other words, watch the mind in action. You can watch it as it's staying with the breath. Watch the breath, watch the feelings. Those four frames of reference are all right here. 
breath, which is the body. You've got the feelings associated with the breath. You've got the mind state that's either staying with the breath or not staying with the breath. And the mental qualities that you can use to deal with anything that's going to pull you away. It's all right here. And when we try to rush through the steps and move on to the next level, the next level, the next level, we miss a lot of things. And that leaves us right back where we started. I had a dream one time when I first started meditating. There was a big museum, and there was a big entrance with a large stairway that went up, but there was also a ladder on the side of the museum where you can go straight up to the top floor. So in the dream I chose the ladder, and I was getting up toward the top, the ladder fell. So I was back where I was, and there I was, right at the entrance. So I said, okay, I didn't die. I guess I have to go up the stairway. The message, of course, was that the meditation was not going to be as fast as I expected it. There was a lot more to learn than just a particular technique. And this is why they have the apprenticeship for the monks. It's not just we're going to learn how to stay with the breath or learn a few stages in meditation and everything is going to open up and then you can get on with the rest of your life. The training is a training in all of your life and all of your mind. So make sure you realize it's an all-around training. And the technique is central to the training, but it's not everything. It gives you some tools you're going to need in order to deal with other issues that come up. And some of them will be issues that you like dealing with, and others are issues that you would rather not, but you've got to deal with them. Whatever comes up in the mind that's going to cause any stress or any trouble in the mind, you've got to learn how to see through it. And it may not be as fast as you like. But this is the only way. So as you focus in on the breath, bring in whatever good qualities you know you have. And as for the not quite so good qualities in the mind, know that they're going to come up too. But don't let them knock you off balance. If they do knock you off balance, you can be like that doll. Just regain your balance and keep on going. This is the path that many have followed. There's a poem of Nandaka about the horse running along and then stumbling, and it gets up and it keeps on running. We don't know what Nandika's stumble was, but we do know that he became an arahant. Take a lesson from people who walk on a tightrope. It's not the case that they're always perfectly balanced. You notice sometimes it looks like they're going to lose their balance, but they've learned how to regain it quickly. That's what keeps them on the rope. So the skill of recovery is one of the most important skills you're going to have as a meditator. Noticing mis a mistake and then correcting for it right away. It's when you refuse to notice a mistake that you fall. <laughs> 